Welcome to Winners Wallets and Worldviews, a podcast on business, leadership, and life. Today's guest, we have Arthur Petropoulos. He is a founding manager partner at Hillview Partners. Today on the show, we talk about mergers and acquisitions, business exits, and capital solutions. Arthur Petropoulos founded Hillview Partners in 2006 after a successful tenure on Wall Street as an investment banker, private equity investor, and head of mergers and acquisitions and corporate development for a high growth operating company. Today on the show, we talk about how small businesses can start to prepare themselves for an exit, how to evaluate merger and acquisition targets, as well as what do we do in this upcoming economy. More on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews, the only show that's going to teach you how to be somebody. Thank you again. Appreciate your time. We're going to talk about the story of Cypress Semiconductor called Zero to a Billion. And you're not going to make it. It's not like being a star quarterback. You guys are all leaders. You, you guys are trying to crush it. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever's going on in your life, you're going to run into that block. Recognize that you're leaving 95% of American business completely behind. You guys are here learning, getting education. You're going to run into someone standing there. No, no. Michael Jordan's humility is what we're talking about. Saying to you, you're not good enough to get through to the other side. And I say to you, let's roll, baby. Let's roll. Excellent. Arthur Petropoulos is joining us today on Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews, a podcast on business, leadership, and life. Uh, really excited to dig into a little bit about business exits, how to structure a business for an exit, and also just talk a little bit about some other uh, business topics that that Arthur has been an expert on, a former uh, Wall Street guy. So we're going to, a uh, former investment banker, so this is going to be exciting to listen to kind of your backstory as well as how the market's going to respond in the future with this uncertainty. So Arthur, welcome to the show. Thank you. Sure thing, Aaron. I appreciate it. It's good to be here and uh, happy to chat. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about your background. As I kind of briefly alluded to in the introduction, uh, you have some investment bank, uh, banking background on Wall Street. Uh, tell me where that all started for you. Sure. So I grew up, if you can tell from the bed, uh, Northeast accent in the Providence area of Rhode Island. And yeah, I always had an interest in businesses and business transactions in particular. And so when you'd read in the newspaper about two companies combining or someone selling something or someone buying something, and in my experience in, in Rhode Island, there's not a huge finance industry. There's a few participants, but uh, it was always attorneys that you would hear uh, were involved with these things or had their hands in things. And so from my perspective, you had to be a lawyer to, to do these things. And so after undergrad, I went to law school here in Rhode Island and uh, studying corporate M&A. And then in that experience is when you really started reading the case law of KKR Nabisco and Blackstone and who are these people? What do they do? And how are they all involved in this ecosystem? So when you kind of can paint that web, you said, oh, I get it now. There's investment banking, private equity, all of these different participants. And so this was going back to 2008, 2009. Uh, when I was finishing law school, and I said, "Well, I have to go to New York to be an investment banker to 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 really understand this." And you know, the funny thing is, it, it, you're so oblivious at that time period where you know the world's coming to an end, right? In 2008, but at the same time, it's like I need a job and I want to get experience, so I'm just going on message boards, finding the top 50 investment banks, the top 100 of this, and just finding whoever I can online and calling everybody. And I you know distinctly remember calling up Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, you know, as they were effectively. Uh, <laughs> unraveling, and you, you you said, "Hey, do you have any jobs?" And I, you know, the guy had said back to me, you know, he said, "Are you effing with me? Do you have any jobs?" You know, and so, <laughs> but you're so, yeah. You know, I was laughing at the time. I lived in a you know condo that my parents owned, and uh, I didn't have cable, and so y- there was no information to kind of uh, rain on your parade, if you will. So we just kept hammering out the phone calls. I finished law school early. I got a job at a firm that had someone who quit right around December of, of, of the particular year. And so they said, hey, you want this job? I said, hey, I have to finish my final. I was going to sit for the bar, blah, blah, blah. But they said, look, if you want this job, come take it. If you don't, you know, good luck. And so it was that kind of a uh, uh, war of attrition happening out there in the, in the Wall Street world. So went out there, took this first job. It was not you know, Morgan Stanley, multi-billion dollar transactions. It was a lot of privately held family entrepreneurs, smaller investment group owned companies looking to either sell themselves or or secure capital. And it was this whole middle market, lower middle market world uh, that initially I I thought, oh, you know, someday I'm going to work my way into the larger deals. But you really fell in love with it because it it was people who owned businesses who it was their wallet. They Mm -hmm. ran the companies, they were the executives, they were the board. 
Uh, and, and so there was this legacy and kind of uh, you know, connection with the business that you just don't see with more of some of the private equity portfolio companies or larger publicly traded companies. And so in any event, that was the kind of getting into, into New York. And then after that first job in investment banking, I worked in private equity uh, at Cantor Fitzgerald, actually, in, in kind of their arm that was going out and acquiring companies. But the neat part was we were acquiring uh, real estate services companies that were all tended to be owned by individuals. And so it was very much the same kind of complexion and in, in ethos of ownership and, and personalities. And then last stint was in uh, running Corp Dev or internal mergers and acquisitions for a data center company that we ended up selling. And then back to Hillview to start. But I'll pause there. But that was kind of the the genesis story. You know, we always paint these beautiful linear lines. It was a little bit of uh, pain and uh, 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 trepidation in the beginning, but did pan out ultimately well. I think that's I think that's an incredible story. I mean, I think that's hilarious. You you call up Lehman Brothers as they're literally falling apart. You, you got any jobs? Are you having kidding me? <laughs> Do you have jobs? No, that's good. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit as uh, as kind of in the pre-show we were discussing. Venture Project is a business incubator. We work with entrepreneurs of various sizes that grow and scale. Um, not always. Not always startups that have uh, a clear exit, investable startups. A lot of them are mom and pop shops. A lot of them um, would be different types of targets for maybe a private equity company versus um, a large kind of sellout or something like that. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about when, when an entrepreneur is going through a business, scaling and starting to kind of mature, um, at what point do you start planning for an exit? And what does that look like and what are the things that would make you valuable to be an acquisition target for somebody if you're looking for that exit sure so i mean candidly i had a music teacher once that was a uh, he's an italian guy that told me do you know why european infrastructure in buildings are so much more beautiful than those in the united states and you know, he, he was a little bit of an arrogant guy, but I said, why is that? And he said, because they built them forever, right? There was never the intention that I was going to build this thing and then mm -hmm. and then exit it or, or, or transfer it. And so as it pertains to companies, sometimes the best companies are those that we say have the optimal balance where they are prepared that they can be valuable for a sale, but where the, the initial thought is to build this thing as if it could be run forever, right? And so look, all businesses do trade hands at some point, and whether that's internally to family, to management, to the next generation, or to an external party. But we would say, if you built the business not to say, how do we get to X revenue as fast as possible? How do we get to X profit as fast as possible? Uh, and then just blow out at the optimal valuation. I think that's never the best place to start. We always like to say a company is how do you think in decades? How do you think in a century? How do you say, what is the ultimate mission of this business and how do we accomplish it? And then when you think around those things, you do things more thoughtfully. So it tends to be that businesses grow in, and I'm sure you see it with companies you're involved with is they grow in stages. At first it's, they make a dollar and then they say, hey, I can make another dollar if I do the same thing. And then they just see how many times they can iterate it. But then at some point, whether that's a million dollars or $10 million, the one person or handful of people making those dollars say, I'm exhausted. I just, there's no more hours in a day. Hey, what are we supposed to do here? And so there's always this pivot slightly back a step to take steps forward of how do you incorporate processes? How do you incorporate other people? How do you incorporate both the process of kind of origination and sourcing business as, long, as well as the execution of business and client fulfillment, if you will. And so we think of a business that's primed or, or really positioning itself well for an exit ultimately uh, in whatever the life event it is that brings that about. Sometimes it's just other interests. Sometimes it is family situations. It's just age or, or, or whatever it might be or an opportunity to join something bigger. But usually the optimal situation is where there's vision forever, right? We have the 10-year plan. We have the 20-year plan. We have a 30-year plan of how this would play out. But at the same time where there's adequate processes in place, and that being people, that being a sales system, a funnel, both an execution system and a retention system for clients. And so if you have the vision plus the processes in place and the infrastructure, that's really when you can make the case that this is a machine at this point. This is no longer a firm. This is a company and this is why it has value you know, to, to a third so, party. So processes and infrastructure are kind of your essential prerequisites before you would even be in a place to consider kind of a sale um, 
and yeah. and you also met you also mentioned something interesting I don't want to underplay is that sure. when you're going to start a business I see this all the time especially with like uh your your common kind of SaaS tech company uh that they're in- instantly starting the business with a 3 year exit plan right and it's like, you know and it, to your point if, if you're not building this to last what is the what is the goal here you know what it's like the uh getting married with a 5 year divorce plan it's like <laughs> it's it's just not the optimal thing you want to hear, right? Because ultimately, when someone's going out to get capital, whether it's early stage or, or or more kind of where we play in private equity or growth equity of a situation, it's like the capital providers want the person they're giving the money to to care a lot more about it than than they do, right? You need to be obsessed with something, right? This the world we live in is so competitive in any avenue that you pursue that if you are not maniacally obsessed with whatever it is that you do, you're just not going to be the best at it because there's going to be someone who is that level of obsessed. And when they get access to the right people and the right capital, they'll eat your lunch. And so it's it's hard to not, it's hard to be obsessed about something that you think, you know, I'm going to spend less time than I spent in high school doing. Well, I think that, and, and I think that that is, that's a message that should be like shouted from the rooftop. Um, I remember I was, I was uh, doing a, a lecture three three years ago or four years ago or something like that, and people were asking about a business exit, and I had never really like answered that question before. So then I I thought about it for a second. I'm like, I don't know. Whenever I when I start my business, I never think of that because um, I'm thinking of kind of like immersing myself into it, and I couldn't tell if that. And then at the, I reflected on that for three years, and I thought that was a bad answer because I said I never planned an exit because as you're talking to all these other entrepreneurs and an exit is kind of the ultimate holy grail of sure. when you can realize a lot of the the benefit of your company. Um, what do you think of that? I mean, is what is the strategy as a as an entrepreneur or as a as a small company? I see a lot of companies, for example, uh, at the venture project that aren't necessarily scalable. They might be sure. a hairstylist, a personal trainer, sure. a chiropractor, um, those types of businesses. And what I'm hearing is if we want to start to set up a person for success. There's got to be something that can live without the person. The business can go on without the person. Is that true? Yeah. And I think that's key, right? So we, we had highlighted, and I think it was Marcus Lamonis that said, you know, people process product, right? Yep. And so, yes, I think the key woman or a key man risk with any business is obviously something that needs to be mitigated such that that person can be involved and directionally provide kind of oversight or, or direction for which way the boat's going. But yes, they you know, it can't be the person doing the thing every single day, or to the extent they are, then any kind of larger transaction will involve their continu- continued involvement in the company for, for some juncture of time. So, so yeah, I think you have to, although you may want to be the, the, the steward of the ship, you do have to find a way for it to kind of row forward with or without you. And that doesn't mean that you must you know there there's a, some concept some CEOs that believe that when they reach a certain point of homeostasis they just need to kind of depart from the business but that's not always true as well right you can still stay involved or be more of the strategic oversight you just have to clearly define those things and make sure that you're not trying to spin too many plates uh, for any one given person in the company yeah and 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 let's say you know when a business is starting to become stagnant or yeah. or they're they're losing vision and we start to enter this world of acquiring other organizations, other small companies, other assets, um, or divesting. Sure. And and how do those? How do you recommend approaching those decisions, or when those are the right uh, topics to start thinking about? Sure. I mean, look, I think life has has seasons, right? Just just as you do in your personal life, so do businesses and have life cycles, and the people involved with them have their own seasons in life. And so when you think of think of a business as we always say businesses are like wine or like milk, right? They're either getting better with age or not, but they're never exactly stagnant and nothing is 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 forever perpetual in the business world. There's always this kind of idea that things will kind of revert back to to, to randomness at, at some point. I think that goes to like quantum physics. But the idea being that you have to keep putting in effort to avoid things kind of fizzling or, or separating. And so we always like to say is if if the season of life for the owners of a business is not kind of uh, conducive towards the ongoing growth of the business or the pushing forward of the business, then it's probably a good time to contemplate that exit, right? And that's not a bad thing, right? It's just there are some times of the different people's lives where kind of growing the business is, is the number one thing. And there's 
plenty of valid reasons why it may not at some point, or they have other objectives in life. And so I'd say it's, you always have to live on kind of the cusp of discomfort, right? And so as a business grows, you get to a point of things are working out really well. There's homeostasis, there's momentum, and it feels comfortable. But if you don't push then beyond that, it starts to contract back in. And so I always say with business owners, when they're looking to the right time to exit may be when they don't feel the burning desire to kind of push to that next level of discomfort. And that's kind of a, a telltale sign of, hey, maybe it's prime time to uh, contemplate a strategic objective or an exit or something. Because you know, just like uh, you know Joe Namath or Willie Mays, right? you can stay around the game too long as well. And so there is kind of an optimal time to do that if you feel like you're, some enthusiasm for the company is is dwindling. Conversely, going to the earlier stage businesses that you may deal with, if you have somebody that feels limited, right, where they're at the stage where it's like, I'm, I'm making X dollars a year, I've got this business humming, but what's the next level? I'm itching for that thing, right? It's, it's somewhat supporting them in what is the means by which they can then push to that next level of discomfort, right? So if it's somebody who owns a, a hairstylist, how do you franchise that out? Same thing we've seen in restaurants, retail, how do you grow this thing? How do you get into kind of other verticals, other horizontal fields in it. And so it really comes down to kind of understanding the person behind the business, what's their tone, temperament, objectives, and what season they are in life. Layer that over what season the business is in, and it usually gives you a good indication as to whether now is the time to do something. Maybe it's a little bit further down the road, or conversely, it's time to really put your foot on the accelerator and see where it goes. This episode is brought to you by Magic Mind. Our friends over at Magic Mind have created a unique blend of neurotropics and mushrooms to help with energy production. So uh, the Magic Mind, it's a drink, comes in a little bottle. It's green. It tastes like a green drink, and it's only got about 35 milligrams of caffeine, but I'm telling you, it has unbelievable capability for focus. So the running joke in the office is that people come and they raid my fridge and they take the magic mind out of the office because it's really effective. Uh, I use it as a pre-workout. I also use it to help me break through an afternoon slump. It's not like coffee or energy drinks that make you jittery. It helps with prolonged focus, especially for really tedious, boring type of work that you might have to do or those things you just have to get done. So I'm a big fan of magic mind. Um, if you guys want to try it out, go over to magicmind.co and use the promo code winners 20 to know that we sent you over there. Let us know what you think. Tag us on social media. And without any further ado, welcome back to the show. Yeah, I like how you use the example of it's either wine or milk. You know, it's either it, it can right. get better with age or poorer with age. And uh, a couple of days ago, last Monday, we were going through uh, one of our accelerator courses. And uh, one of the guys in it, he was he was kind of like an open socialist, you know. So he gives us trouble a lot of times on uh, sure. business cycles, <laughs> and uh, but you know it's all in good fun. And 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 we go over kind of a business cycle of how there's a there's a startup, there's an accelerated growth stage, there's kind of a maturity, and then there's this opportunity where business can die or business grows. And uh, he said, so so every time we start a business, it's set up for failure. Is that what we're saying? You know, he he starts pushing back, and I thought about that for a second. I said, well. That's everything is if we in, in life, if you go out the door and you don't eat that day, you're going to start dying. If you don't drink water, you're going to start dying. If you don't start taking care of yourself, you're going to die. And it's the same as a business. There's this constant propensity to innovate, to improve, to grow. And when a company is in a position to acquire a vertical or horizontal and by vertical, we're talking about uh, maybe buying suppliers or sure. maybe acquiring um uh, uh, vendors of, of different kinds, or if we're talking about a horizontal, we're, we're talking about potentially buying competitors or, or things like that. Um, sure. for the, for those on the audience, I think that, that might not know what those markets might be, but that would be an idea of constantly improving because like you, to your point, it's either wine or milk. It's right. either matter with age or not. Right. And look, that's private equity, publicly traded companies. I mean, they're all very cognizant of these things is that you know, nothing, no business just kind of stays perpetually wildly successful, right, without doing some of those things. And so when you think of the space that we largely play in, in terms of helping middle market, lower middle market companies exit or sell themselves, we always say, because there's three main reasons for that, right? The first being what everyone thinks of is kind of the profitability of the company and just acquiring that EBITDA, pre-tax earnings of it or revenue. The second, though, is access to customers, right? So large companies who want access to customers of a smaller company that even though the company is small may have access to great customers, that's a, a win for the big company because now they have the opportunity to sell all these other things to it. 
And then lastly, and I think getting to your point here, as we say, it's capabilities, it's solutions, it's tools, it's innovation, right? It, it, it takes a long time to move a large boat. So it's a lot easier for the Fortune 500 to go around looking in the middle market for companies that are innovative, that are nimble, that have these new ideas and ways to kind of bring the business forward and buy that much more uh, time, if you will, of, of, of innovation and growth. And, and to your point earlier too about the, you know, the comments of your uh, Marxist friend, uh, but uh, jokes aside, is, you know, everything in this universe is low probability at some point, right? Like just the starting of a business, the idea that it could be successful, the idea that you could go out and survive that we're this close to the sun, right? So it's like, you can take the view that you know every day you're dying or you can take the view that every day you've got this magical opportunity to kind of take the biggest crack at anything you want ever right it's like the you know you, you can it's like the the inverse view from the philo philosophical days of like nihilism right you can take it as one perspective of nothing matters or you can take it as from the stoic view that everything matters every opportunity every moment and so we like that in business right it's like that's the exciting part about business they get to get up every day as we do in our business and you do with yours and you get to try to you know rip the stuffing out of the ball every time the pitch comes down the strike zone so it's you know it's a matter of perspective but we take an optimistic view towards uh towards everything here yeah well and while we're on the topic of uh sure. our marxist friend um the, the <laughs> it is we're as, as a business is starting to evaluate the let's say like for example i'm coming into a good cash position with my business in the next couple months and sure. we've got some weird market activity that's happening uh what are in your, if you were to opine on potential opportunities to be on the lookout for um, in various markets, what what would be those types of opportunities that you're looking at, or that you think would would be a good or a good a good place to explore? I should say, from from the perspective of uh, buying a company or acquiring business. Yeah, so if you wanted to buy and acquire a company sure. or competitors, or, or potentially for small businesses, just large assets of kinds. Um, sure. What should we be looking at, especially with how the, the economy's kind of looking in the in the near future. Yeah. So I th I think there's sometimes a proclivity for people to try to think of the the brilliant idea, right? The thing that no one's ever thought of before. But uh, you know, the the saying goes, and I forget if it Alex Hormozzi, whoever said it, but right, look at any business that works and do it in half the time. Or or do it twice as good. Or 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 you know, you don't like to compete on price necessarily, but Find something that works that that maybe someone else has gotten lazy about, and that's where there's opportunity. And so, you know, whether it's, I know people who are, you know, running uh, brick distribution companies that are, are making a fortune just because they're that much more reactive, responsive, and on the ball versus perhaps somebody who's owned the business for 50 years is resting on their laurels to some degree. And so, you know, in our business, we tend to focus on, you know, call it industry wise, profitable software. So it's not always the super high growth, but just consistent profit generating software, business to business uh, services, business to consumer services, specialty distribution, niche manufacturing. So we have this idea sometimes from from the the, the Twitterverse, right? That that every business that's successful has to be something really innovative, really sexy, yeah. really shiny. But in reality, it's find something that works, that you have a slight interest in, that you can somehow figure out to get an edge on your competition just a little bit. And iterate and replicate and grow. And so there's there's tons of businesses out there. As I said uh, to somebody the other day, this is a generational shift of ownership and business where a massive amount of US, if we're just thinking domestically, GDP is transferring hands in the next 10 years, given the baby boomers are kind of retiring. And there's going to be huge opportunities, whether in buying these businesses, acquiring these businesses in almost every field of whether you want to call it the new economy or just the real economy. So there's guys out there now, men and women get, making fortunes, you know, uh, running landscaping companies, window cleaning businesses, uh, all sorts of very simple things, as well as software, you know, and all the innovative stuff as well. So I'd say, you know, whether it's this buy, sell, whether it's talking to people like us, you know, depending on the size of company you're looking for, Keep an eye open for anything that has a defensible edge, right? So we say, that, you know, I think Buffett said it, what's the mo? What's the durable competitive advantage of a situation? If you can define that for a business, I don't care if you're selling software or snow cones, you'll make money. And so that's the neat thing is there's opportunity everywhere. There's a generational shift happening. And so I think it it's, I would just say to people, don't limit your view to things that 
you know, you think are the best companies to be in. Limit your view to things that actually are successful, and you'll see there's a lot more opportunity than you might initially presume. Yeah, I've been reading a lot about um, some trends in kind of the Ivy League MBA courses around uh, acquiring Middle America, you know, HVAC company, for example. Sure and things like that. And then there's the other side of it. I have some circles of friends that think that's funny because then there you have the, the preppy Ivy leaguer that's trying to interact with a blue collar working team and it doesn't work well. That's more of a culture issue, but, um, either way there's, sure. there's a lot of these opportunities to your point coming up where there's a new generation turning over. And there are things like that, that aren't necessarily some kind of sexy new network, uh, social network, but right. it's, it's something that seriously cash flows. Um, Right, because you can almost think of it from a, you know, if you really get into the weeds of kind of the, how the capital ecosystem works too, right? Like early stage companies that are growing, uh, that are in these sexy fields, they get venture capital to oftentimes grow at a operating loss for a very long time. And so those well-capitalized companies are, are very difficult to compete with. I mean, they would have called that predatory pricing a hundred years ago, but now in this new ecosystem, it's innovation, but it won't get on those topics. But so the point being is sometimes you have less competition in the in the more tried and true fields just because there's less people at, that can possibly operate those companies at a loss, right? It's almost like if the fundamentals must exist in a business, then you can more compete based on the fundamentals versus a wacky capital stack. And so I think to some extent with what's happening in the economy to, to, to you know, kind of tail back to what you were saying, it's, it's, you know, obviously no one likes to see recessions in pain, but at the same time, reconciling the capital ecosystem is not the worst thing because if you can get participants in different industries to compete truly on fundamentals, it does tend to be that the cream rises to the top. So, so I want to talk, I want to ask a little bit about that. Um, sure. Should we have time to dig into it for a second? Is you mentioned the fundamentals. What are these fundamentals? And I, I imagine that's going to go both ways. That's going to be when you're prepping for a sale or that's going to go if you're looking for an acquisition target. What are these fundamentals that you would recommend um, evaluating when it comes to due diligence? Sure. So, I mean, you can really think of just the baseline numbers and components of how a business comes together. So you, you start it at the top of the funnel and say sales, right? Is there a system for a sales system for a company that can scale? And when you look at the actual sales versus COGS, you know, there was this cartoon they used to have in people's offices that would say, hey, boss, we lose a dollar on every widget we manufacture. And he says, don't worry, we'll make it up in volume, right? And it's like, you can't be in the business of selling $10 bills for $8, right? Obviously, there have been companies that have done it, Jet.com, that ultimately get bought. But that's, I want to say it's an idiosyncrasy of capitalism. Truly, if you look at the fundamentals, you want to make sure that there's a gross margin in whatever you're selling. Again, widgets, hot dogs, or software. If you're selling it for a dollar, how much does it cost to make? And is there a good spread there? And then when you look at the operating expenses of the business, you say, is it right-sized in terms of, is there profit left over after the operating expenses? Uh, how much, they call it operating leverage, how much bigger could this company be with the people in place? And is there kind of a, a well, well-oiled machine that can support further growth? So the idea being sales grow, everything from the, from the gross margin perspective should grow because you'll get better purchasing power and more details there. But You'll have more money kind of contributing over the same operating core of the business, leading to more profit. And so if someone can paint the picture of, you know, I would say it's like the elevator pitch of business, right? If you're looking at a company, if you're looking to sell a business or if you're looking to buy a business, you need the narrative to be three sentences. You know, company does A, B, C. We are the best because of X, Y, Z. We make X in revenue, Y in expenses, Z in EBITDA or profit, right? And if you can paint that picture... Right. The best deals are those that can be written on one side of a of a, a you know cue card, not the ones that need 500 pages to di divulge into. So that's when we say the fundamentals, right? It's like, and I don't know if this was Buffett or Charlie Munger again, but if your neighbor came across the street and explained this thing to you, could they explain it? And if they did, would you want it, right? And if those things happen, it's more than likely that the fundamentals are pretty sound uh, and that it's not just, you know, fantasy land type stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, and looking at looking at sales and operating um, and kind of your operating revenue versus your expenses and, and the simple profit loss kind of kind of formula. And, and and I wonder, do you do you evaluate, if so, like the balance sheet in ways where do you care about the assets um, if it's if it, it is unless it's just we're just using these assets to kind of drive profitability. 
you know, so it depends on the industry. There are some more asset light or asset intensive businesses. And so manufacturing, you know, companies, you'd certainly look at kind of the FF&E or the furniture fixtures equipment in, in what does the machinery look like? How depreciated is it? What are the, uh, is there deferred maintenance on it? You know, when you think of large asset intensive businesses, you can almost think of them quasi real estate where almost everything is depreciating at some mm-hmm. level. And so if you think of the the assets of the business as being necessary to generate revenue, then you would be more inclined to, to fo- have a balance sheet consideration. I'd say for more asset light businesses, distribution, a lot of services companies, software, the balance sheet's indicative, right? Of It's like looking at somebody's house, right? Like they might be the nicest person, but if their house is a disaster, you kind of have a sense as to how things are run. So even if the P&L for a business looks good this year, if the balance sheet is in shambles, it can be indicative that there's been issues. Uh, and conversely, we have companies that might have a very steady trotting P&L where they do the same thing every year, the same profit. And you look at the balance sheet, and there's just a ton of cash on the balance sheet. And so it's really indicative that like, wow, they really have conservatively and prudently run this business in a way that's been intelligent. And so, you know, candidly, at most transactions in the middle market and lower middle market are consummated on a book called cash-free, debt-free basis. So seller of the company is expected to take the excess capital out also to repay debt on the company. And so it's not as imperative as it would be for, say, a public acquisition or something in terms of debt, because usually the debt in the cash doesn't come along with it. But we'd say at the very least, we like to see a very clean, good balance sheet that shows some retained equity, that shows, you know, I think prudent stewardship of the business because it just helps the narrative. As in any business, we are in the business of presenting these opportunities to the broader institutional capital food chain, if you will, and the better and more crystallized our narrative can be, the more successful we're going to be. So if the balance sheet is good, it only helps. Uh, Yes, that's the simplest answer. It can only be helpful. Yeah. And I think that's a great answer because, I mean, like in, in a in a real estate investor, um, something that's a little bit more liquid, like maybe a multifamily property can be sold as, as part of a revenue stream in a, in a weird way. Sure. Um, a- assets with, and realizing equity in those types of properties is a good measurable target. But I think that's kind of unique in a lot of ways because most companies probably don't churn over assets like that. Um, right. Revenue model, you know. No, you're right. Inventory or something like that, but. You know, there's always this concern. I think when we're selling a middle market company, it's a valid concern that there'll there'll be mass layoffs, or that you know you sell a company with ten people and that they're going to fire half of them. But you know, at, at some level, it's the company would not function without those people because they're not, you know, particularly in services companies, they are not asset intensive businesses. And so, mm-hmm. what we like to see is that most acquirers of our companies we're representing are heavily inclined to keep the people because that's the valuable part of it. Those are the you know, the, the human capital of the business is largely what they're acquiring in addition to the goodwill, the the reputation and the cash flow generating power of the business. But uh, yeah, I think the, the, again, people, product processes is much more important at this size of business than than kind of hard assets or, or, or anything like that. So I want to take the last couple uh, minutes here, just kind of talk a little bit about what you do. Um, sure. If I'm interested in, in acquiring verticals, horizontals, or people out there listening are, uh, and then kind of like what your company does and how how you can help. Sure. So our company, we help companies, privately held, family, entrepreneur, small investment group owned, so tightly held private companies, uh, generally, typically generating 400000 to $4 million in EBITDA or pre-tax earnings to either sell their businesses or exit or seek or secure capital. And so again, industries of specialization, profitable software, B2B, B2C services, uh, distribution, specialty manufacturing, and other things as well. Uh, But we work with companies to kind of go through our process of crystallizing the narrative, getting the opportunities in front of the right people, having these conversations in parallel with 100 plus people, and really solving some of the pain points. And we didn't get into it much, but uh, in selling a company like this, there's a lot, it's a very inefficient process. It can be very distracting to ownership. It's not discreet. And the results are not often good on an unrepresented basis. So we are helping companies effectuate these goals, but efficiently, expeditiously, quietly, and with no distraction. And then ultimately kind of narrowing that field of prospective acquirers or capital providers down, negotiating the deal, and working through diligence towards closing. So it's really end-to-end. We work with companies. We are what you call sell-side representation. So we represent the companies. 
in accomplishing either an exit or securing of capital. And we really are kind of zealous advocates throughout the entirety of that process. Because I think people are used to having an accountant to talk about tax stuff with, an attorney to talk about legal stuff with. But when it comes to strategic objectives, business exits, securing capital, you know, very large companies have corporate development departments, but middle market, lower middle market companies, they don't really have a good resource for this. And so that's our area of specialization. That's what we are maniacally obsessed with and kind of spend our days you know, talking and, and, and working with people as many hours as I can stay awake. Well, are there any last uh, parting words of wisdom for people in business, leadership, life, entrepreneurship that you can think of that, that would stick with them and hopefully allow them to improve uh, various aspects of their of their business world? You know what? I would just say uh, two things. Don't do something for 10 minutes if you wouldn't do it for 10 years, right? I think I think the longer people think in terms of duration is usually pretty a uh, good approximation of, of how successful they're going to be at it. Uh, and then other than that, I would just say, uh, you know, an early an early mentor of mine once said in a meeting, is we were talking about a business transaction going on, and I said, oh, I thought they were a friend. And he said, you know what, Arthur, if you want a friend, get a dog. And <laughs> while I don't take as, as cynical a view of things towards that, I do think they're you know, in business, there's a lot of excitement around the starting of things. There's a lot of excitement around the exit of things. And, you know, it should be that way. And that's great. But there's a lot of business that's kind of this slog of pain and growth and evolution in the middle, where it's just going to be uh, you and God, and and you got to make it work. And so, you know, there was a, a war veteran I talked to one time, and I said, he was a World War II vet. And he said, I said, what'd you do in the foxholes? And, you know, I was he said, you prayed to God. And I said, well, what if you didn't believe to God? He goes, believe me, kid, when you heard what was going on, you found a God. And so I think it's very much the same I say in business, right? Is that we get up, we work hard every day. You know, God deals the cards, we play the hands. But I think that helps as well. So in any event, look, this is our uh, view of the universe, if you will. But uh, I hope it's of some help to anyone listening. And uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity, Aaron, to be on here. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm a God-fearing man myself, so I, I think that uh, there's a lot of cool things you can do in the world um, to help glorify and serve Him, so I appreciate that. Now, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time, and this has been uh, an absolute pleasure. Uh, for those of you listening, this is Winner's Wallet's Worldviews Podcast, Business, Leadership, and Life. Thank you.